For a long time now, much like winter, I've been telling everybody that these reviews were coming. Well, Merry Christmas, guys, because winter is here. Wind and words. We are only human and the gods have fashioned us for love. That is our great glory and our great tragedy. I am surrounded by flatterers and fools. It can drive a man to madness. Half of them don't dare tell me the truth and the other half can't find it. A lord must learn that sometimes words can accomplish what swords cannot. I swear to you, sitting a throne is a thousand times harder than winning one. Give me honorable enemies rather than ambitious ones, and I'll sleep more easily by night. Fear cuts deeper than swords. Some will wounds never truly heal and bleed again at the slightest word. Let them see that their words can cut you, and you'll never be free of the mockery. If they want to give you a name, take it and make it your own. They can't hurt you with it anymore. I have a realistic grasp of my own strengths and weaknesses. My mind is my weapon. My brother has a sword, King Robert has his warhammer, and I have my mind. And a mind needs books as a sword needs a whetstone if it is to keep its edge. Never forget what you are, for surely the world will not. Make it your strength, then it can never be your weakness. Armor yourself in it, and it will never be used to hurt you. The heart lies and the head plays tricks with us, but the eyes see true. The man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. If you would take a man's life, you owe it to him to look into his eyes and hear his final words. And if you cannot bear to do that, then perhaps the man does not deserve to die. Lords are gold and knights are steel, but two links cannot make a chain. You also need silver and iron and lead, tin and copper and bronze and all the rest. Those are farmers and smiths and merchants and the like. A chain needs all sorts of metals, and a land needs all sorts of people. Summer will end soon enough, and childhood as well. For winter is coming. Yes, when you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. But why is it always the innocents who suffer most? when you High Lords play your Game of Thrones. Hey, what's up, bookworms, bastards, and broken things? Mike back finally, guys, to do a review for one of my favorite books of all time, guys. This is going to be 1996, going all the way back to talk about A Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin the first in the song of Ice and Fire. And yes, guys, lots of editions of this book are floating around here. I think I've had five editions of this book uh, since I first started reading it way back in the year 2000. Now, if you don't know, guys, this is a Locus Award winner in 1997. I think it won like a spinoff novella or something for uh, Hugo in 1997, but it wasn't actually this book that won the Hugo. But it's commonly listed as one of the most influential books in all of the fantasy genre and it's easy to see why now i read this for the first time in the year 2000 here's the story real quick talked about it more at length in other videos but i started reading wheel of time because i was just i was tired of reading lord of the rings over and over again i said wheel of time feels like the natural progression but i was reading it i said i just I want something different just wasn't really feeling it and so my roommate said all right well if you want something that's much, much different. I think that you should check this out. So he says, the third book just came out and it's awesome. You got to try it. So he handed me a Game of Thrones and I ate it up. And guys, I probably read this book about a dozen times now. And that's not hyperbole. I really have because there was only three books out 
when I started reading this series, I just kind of read them over and over and over again. And uh, yeah, I finally got around to rereading the uh, the first one here again for the first time in 11 years with this beautiful Folio Society edition of A Game of Thrones. And it's just, uh, I said, hey, it's time to start to finally review these on the channel. When I first started, the channel was right around the time when the show went off the air and their opinions about this series were just so nuclear hot. I said, I don't want to talk about the books right now because all it's going to come back to is why the show sucks or something. So I wanted to wait a little time and now that enough time's gone by and I am revisiting them. I said, hey, now is the best time to talk a little song of ice and fire. So yes, like I said, I did start a reread of the series earlier this year because of this Folio Society edition. And I've read this and the Clash of Kings now, but uh, today we're gonna talk about game of a Game of Thrones and basically what makes this book so special because special it is guys, but that's gonna begin by talking about what is this book about now long ago in a time forgotten, a preternatural event threw the seasons out of balance. In a land where summers can last decades and winters a lifetime, trouble is brewing. The cold is returning, and in the frozen waste to the north of Winterfell, sinister forces are massing beyond the kingdom's protective wall. To the south, the king's powers are failing. His most trusted advisor is dead under mysterious circumstances, and his enemies are emerging from the shadows of the throne. At the center of the conflict lies the Starks of Winterfell, a family as harsh and as yielding as the frozen land they were born to. And now Lord Eddard Stark is reluctantly summoned to serve as the king's new hand, an appointment that threatens to sunder not only his family, but the kingdom itself. Meanwhile, across the narrow sea, Prince Viserys, heir to the fallen house Targaryen, which once ruled all of Westeros, schemes to reclaim the throne with an army of barbarian Dothraki, whose loyalty he will purchase in the only coin left to him, his beautiful yet innocent sister, Daenerys. Guys, 1996, this is a Game of Thrones. This is going to be a long one, guys. Just letting you know. So what makes this book good or bad? Obviously, we're going to start with the good because it's pretty much all good. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you know that now. Uh, the characters are very much unforgettable in this series. Not only are they great, but I think that he differentiates them so well that basically anytime you just could flip to a random page and read the dialogue and you know what character you're spending time with because he gives them their own voice in such a magical way. You know, I it was just so different to me when I read this. I never read characters like this in a fantasy book before. Sure, it has something things that might be kind of familiar to you. You know, you got like your jaded king, some loyal servants, you know, scheming family members, that type of thing. That was nothing new to me. But when your main characters are essentially a bastard, an imp, and a 13-year-old girl who's basically using, being used as a chess piece, I knew I was reading something very, very different. And it was just, inc they were incredibly damaged characters and they all had their flaws. And what made them unique was that even your, you know, goody little two-shoes traditional fantasy heroes, they had flaws too. Like for example, Ned Stark is basically the most honorable guy on the planet right now, right? And even he has a bastard son, right? So even he has some flaws, has some skeletons in the closet. And that just immediately just piqued my interest. And I think it's just, I don't want to say it's like a deconstruction, but it is to a point where with his characters is they were so realistic in that, you know, you would take a regular, just traditional fantasy hero in any just traditional fantasy story you've ever read and you plop them in this world and you would see with the Starks how, hmm, maybe that wouldn't go so well with a traditional fantasy hero because this world is just so different and it's different because of these characters that are in it. And then he gives them all individual animal companions, which is just like, who isn't there for that, right? So yeah, the characters are just absolutely stunning. You're never gonna forget any of them. They're gonna live in your head forever. And it all begins with this book. They're all just fantastic, right? off the, I mean, just right from the story starting point, you are connecting with these characters. I mean, there's just a first interaction between Jon Snow and Tyrion. That first interaction is something that has never left my memory because it's just so incredible. I'm like, wow, the way that they're talking to each other. And I guess that's got to bring me to the dialogue here. The dialogue is some of the most quotable stuff ever. Now, it's not anything you might, I mean, you might. Uh, I think the show proved that. Is it might not be anything that kind of enters your daily vocabulary. It's not anything you're going to be using in a daily conversation, unless you're, you know, like me, you're married to a fellow Song of Ice and Fire nerd. You can probably do that. But it's stuff that's like, you know, just you'll you'll think about it always. It's stuff that you could see printed on a t-shirt or a poster or a banner and stuff. And that's even before the, the television show got really, really popular. It's just the lines were just that strong. The dialogue is just so well done. And I, I usually say sometimes it's like, I never feel like, you know, this is something the characters wouldn't say to each other. In this world, 
it definitely feels like the way that characters would talk to each other because these are nobles mostly. They're highly educated. You can see them speaking to each other in this way. And there's just so much dialogue that just back and forth, the banter between the characters is so believable and so fresh and so original that you just love every single conversation. You love a battle. I mean, who doesn't? I mean, that's why we read fantasy. We love us a good fight, right? But with this, you have two characters in a scene alone just talking to each other. And it's some of the most riveting stuff in the entire book because this dialogue just pops off so well. You get really excited when it is just a scene of two characters talking to each other. But I gotta say, guys, the world building on this, I don't think besides J.R.R. Tolkien, anyone has done it better. Now, I know we all have our own favorite worlds and things like that, but I've never gotten to a world, even with just book one, where you will hear so many things just kind of mentioned in passing, and you'll want to know more. You know, and I, I know that the, the info dumps and exposition are kind of naughty words sometimes with fantasy, because uh, sometimes it does. It just feels like you're having to do homework. With this, I feel like you're craving them. You want them. They mention so many things or kind of just mentioned in, in, in conversations that you want to know more about. You know, you hear about how the dragons died out. You hear about Robert's Rebellion, the Long Night, things like this. You want to know more about these things. In fact, you want, I sometimes when I'm reading this, I want the characters just to kind of walk over to that bookshelf, pull a history book off and just start reading it to me on the page. That's how much I want to know about this world because he makes it just so interesting, so compelling, so deep. And I feel like he gives you just enough nuggets where it's like, okay, he isn't just he isn't just bullshitting here. He knows what he's talking about when he's writing about it. He isn't just making stuff, oh yeah, this is when such and such did such and such. No, he actually has, okay, in his head, he knows this is an actual event that happened. And we did see that obviously with, you know, over time when we got to like a, a fire and blood and things like that, he had a lot of these things in place. But uh, another thing is like, it's like, you look at his map. And I don't feel like, even in just this first book, there's no real seriously dead spots. I feel like he takes you all around the Westeros map in this book, and he really fills out everything into a way where you don't ever feel like you're confused. You're like, oh God, we're flying all over the place. I don't know where we are. I don't know who these kings are. He gives you just enough information to not overwhelm you, to get you interested, and gives you a little bit more as the book goes on. I think he just paces it perfectly like that. And that is the perfect way to build a world this big. Because it is. It's a humongous world. And he builds it so, so well just in this first book, which is just, just amazing. But uh, the myths, the legends, and the prophecies in this fantastic stuff and i mean it's 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 stuff that obviously would kind of expand as the series went on but even in this first book i uh, some of these some of these prophecies are laid on thick thick in some of this history some of this lore i mean you got stuff like the uh, the uh, the the stallion that mounts the world the three-eyed raven uh, i already mentioned the others the long night uh it's just there's so much stuff that's just kind of just packed in this book where you're like I don't know what that is, but I want to know more. But, you know, then you get some things that do get answered in this book, which are actually kind of surprising because I felt like for when I found this, I knew at the time that it was book three and the series was still going. So I knew I was going to get all my answers in this first book. But I feel like you do get some answers, but uh, you get even more questions. But it's not in a frustrating way. It's in a, oh, my gosh, I can't wait to see what happens next way. So he lays out things that uh, in a lot of series, I won't lie, some of the prophecies can just kind of be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You're just kind of throwing a bunch of stuff out there. No, these feel well-crafted, well thought out, and you will spend lots of time trying to decipher what this one thing means. What does this one line mean? And again, that's something that will kind of increase as the series goes along, but they are in this book. I have to say, guys, the politics. The politics in this are the best in-world politics I've ever read in fiction. It is not even close. I crave the political conversations in these books. Like the small council scenes, amazing. Whenever you've got like uh, Tyrion and Tywin talking, superb. It's just so, so good. I love these moments. I love these moments so much more than the actual battles, which are great. The battles in this book are awesome. They're so good. Better than I really, I think that this book even needs them to be. They're that good. But the political scenes and just the conversations between two or three characters, is just top notch. I love the court politics in this. I love the backroom scheming, uh, all of that stuff, like Littlefinger, all the stuff that him and Barris kind of get into. They're kind of they're bantering back and forth about who knows more. Such such amazing amazing work, just crafting this huge politically driven world and just showing that man. If you ain't got uh, all the the power and all the rumors and all the secrets and all every everything in your pocket that you need to really get ahead in this world, uh, you're not going to win this whole game that they're playing. And he just he lays it out so perfectly. So, 
Every single meeting, every decision, every conversation feels like it can have huge, huge life or death stakes. And a lot of time it does. <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing is every time you think you see what's coming, he pulls something else out that just kind of surprises you. You didn't see it coming at all. It was so unexpected, but you know, it's welcome. It's just, it's so good, guys. Uh, he It just helps demonstrate that no one is safe in these books. And I mean, no one. <laughs> and I think that was kind of a revelation to me is the realism, the grittiness, and, and the shocking twists of this book. Uh, this world is just so cruel and unforgiving. And it was just nothing like I had read it in fantasy at the time. Like I said, the, the darkest thing I had read up to this point was the first three or four Dark Tower books. So uh, it, even those, even though they were much different than any other fantasy I'd ever read, they didn't have anything like this. You know, I still felt like in that mostly your main cast was still safe. In this one, it's like, wow, this is very realistic in that no one is safe. Anyone can die. And I mean anyone can die. There's a death in this book. The first time I was reading it, went into it knowing nothing about it. First time I'm reading it, I think, okay, okay, I've got my, my hero. This is the character I'm following. And then there's a very specific scene at the Sept of Baylor, there, if you've been living in a cave and you don't know what I'm talking about, let's just say I literally threw my mass market paperback across the room. I was so, so mad. And then I ran across the room and picked it up <laughs> because I had to see what happened next. I had never seen anything like that in Fantasy Four. No, it's commonplace now. Everybody does that now. No, but hell, they love to kill off a, a POV character, you know? But with this, it was like so shocking. I thought, this is the character I'm going to follow for the whole series, you know? And that he, this character gets off in the first book is just, oh my God. And it just showed me no one's safe. And I really was just stunned. But it set the tone for me to be like, okay, well, I guess I don't know what's going to come in this book because it's just one of those things where you see every other fantasy uh, someone's going to swing in at the last second and save them. Robin Hood's going to you know, shoot an arrow and save somebody or something. Now, like I said, you might be a little desensitized to it now, but it doesn't help. Uh, it doesn't change the fact that this series relies on just crazy shocking twists and George taking characters from you that you love. He will do that. Characters you love, characters you hate, characters you hate to see go regardless of you know how, where you how you feel about them. He has no problems taking them. And I think that's actually something that's quite you know needed in fantasy because what I love about it is it shows that death doesn't stand in a line. You know, we don't die when uh, we've crossed everything off of our to-do list. You know, it, death waits for no man. And I love that. It, someone could have plenty of story left to tell. <laughs> Random arrow. Gotcha. You know, that can happen in this series. And I think some people might think he just does it for shock value, but I don't think so. I think it's earned in this series because it's realistic and he's given you time to have a reason, a rooting interest in a character before he does that. And he's just so good at it. His character work's amazing. His politics are brilliant. But his grittiness and his realism is going to keep you on your toes and, and have you just... Even though you think you're prepared, you're not prepared when it happens, and it will just completely emotionally assassinate you in all the best ways. I still think that George does get power off of his reader's tears. But that's the thing is, I think that uh, something that's kind of got misconstrued about the series, everybody thinks that the series got popular because George will kill his characters. That's not true at all. It isn't just nihilism, guys. That's what's amazing about this. I know this is classified still as grimdark, and I'd agree. It is very grimdark. But I do think that there is still good in it because there are characters who want to do good. Sure, that most of them, some of them, a lot of them, most of them have ulterior motives. Or they were looking out for number one. They do want to help their family succeed. They do want to help themselves in this game of, 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 a, power, of a power struggle. But there are certain characters where I feel like they do want to do good. They may not be perfect. They may make mistakes. But this series has hope. It has optimism. It has characters overcoming great odds. These are all things that you wouldn't get if this was just a series with a bunch of nihilism and character deaths. That's not what made this series as popular as it is. It has so many characters that, you know, for example, John and, and Tyrion and Daenerys, they don't, they aren't given much of a chance. These characters don't have much of a chance in this world, but they keep on fighting. They never give up. And they have a world outlook that makes them relatable. It makes you want to root for them. It gets you on their side, even when they do some of those things that might be a little detestable or you might look at from a traditional fantasy standpoint and say, wow, that was that was kind of bad. That wasn't a very good thing for them to do. But you know what? 
I'm on board with it because I'm rooting for this character now. He is a pro at that. And I love that he has these characters that just never give up. They do not have anything going for them. And they don't give up. And then you've got characters, you know, uh, like Ned, who say he discovers a bombshell in this book. And even then, he tries to do something good out of it instead of immediately turning to you know, you know something that wouldn't end well. You know, he tries to find a peaceful resolution. Again, that isn't if this was a book was just nihilism, that's not what you'd get. And for example, when the world doesn't seem fair, you know, Caitlin, she'll do anything that she can to, you know, do what she can to help her family. Or when tragedy strikes, families pull together and they take care of their own. These are themes in this book. Everybody says these books have no heart, but they have a ton of heart. They're not heartless. He has so much heart with some of these characters, and you believe that they care about each other. Now, they will do awful things, like I said, and a lot of times they'll do awful things to those people that they love. That's not being swept under the rug here, but this isn't a series that's just hopeless and gritty nihilism. It is nothing like that. It has a ton of heart. It just comes from unlikely places that casual fantasy readers aren't really used to. So, yeah, there's not much wrong with this book. So when I got to get to the, the the bad, per se, or maybe the parts that you know didn't really work, I don't really have anything, guys. I think this is about as perfect of a start as you can have to any fantasy series. Uh, I, I think maybe if you're bothered by bad language, uh, excessive violence, strong sexual situations, uh, yeah, it might not be the book for you. Uh, I, I think that if those are things that are bothering you, I don't think this is the series that you should be reading because George very much bases his series on history. So there might be some things that people say are outdated. Uh, well, well, George, look, George is very in your face about it and he makes no apologies for it. And so if that's something that's going to bother you, yeah, definitely, this isn't going to be the series for you. Uh, again, uh, a lot of things in history aren't pretty. And he doesn't try to cover those up with, you know, uh, wish fulfillment. He will be in your face about it, like I said. And he gives zero Fs about who he upsets with it. So you have been warned. For me, these aren't bad things. I think that they make the story absolutely realistic. And I love it. I love it to death. So, you know, if that makes me a bad person, I guess I just always will have that grim, dark heart right down here. So guys, why should you read it? Look, I think for me, the question that I get asked the most is, look, I watch the show. Is it even worth it for me to read the books? Well, for me, I always think that you should read the books, even if you do like an adaptation, because no matter how good an adaptation is, the book's always better. And that's the case with this. Look, season one of the show was a straight adaptation of this book. And it's as literal as you can get. It's damn near perfect. It really is. There are some budget constraints or some things that are kind of glossed over, but there's so much more you will get out of the book. There's so many internal monologues. There's so many things on the screen that last six seconds that are you know much, much longer in the book, and they're much more fun to read, I think. So even as little an adaptation as it was, you'll get much more out of this book. I think you'll get a lot more things out of some side characters that you didn't like. Like I think, for example, like Jora. Jora has much more expansion in this book than even I remembered until this most recent reread. So uh, if you want to know more about some of these characters that you liked on the show and you felt like you always kind of wish that they'd have more screen time, you'll probably get it in the book. So I always am going to say to read the book. So even as good of an adaptation as season one was, yes, the book is still better. And I think it's better by a significant margin. So yes, you absolutely should should read the book even if you have watched the show. I think another thing is if you want to see, say you're a modern fantasy reader only, you've only read stuff from like, you know, 2010 up. You want to see what every single modern fantasy author is trying to capture, then you should read this book. Now look, I'm not saying that George was the first to do this. I'm just saying he did it the best. He did it the best to the point where every damn author now is trying to emulate what this book did. Some have gone close, some have not quite hit the mark, some have tried too hard, some have been so blatant about it, they named their book a blank of blank and blank, you know? <laughs> and that's quite obvious what they're trying to do. They're trying to capture that crowd. Why do you think every single blurb on the front of a fantasy book now says, it's Game of Thrones meets blank, you know, because they want to kind of capture that same audience. So uh, again, I think if you want a, a full-on fantasy experience that's like no other, amazing characters, well-developed lands, lore, histories, and just uh, some some just some scheming and some politicking like you've never ever experienced before. This is going to be the read for you. Look, I've been reading this series for twenty plus years, and I've been trying to find something that's even close to it, guys. And nothing does it. Nothing. There's been some series that I have loved. There's some series I adore. They've never come close to what George has been able to do just with this first book. 
And that's just a testament to the guy's greatness. It really, really is. So final thoughts, guys. Uh, without a doubt, this is the best book one of any fantasy series ever. Yes, even over Fellowship of the Ring. This is the best first book in a fantasy series ever. That would be my blurb on the front of this book. It has character arcs in book one that are so good that any other author would take five, six books to do it. And they don't feel rushed. They feel complete. They feel earned. They feel very well done. There are character journeys in this that are like, wow, I cannot believe how much he packs this many characters into this first book. And he packs so much satisfying story into it because he's so good. The pacing is perfect. The dialogue is top notch. The action isn't overdone. But like I said, when the action happens, man, he just might be the best at that too. So this is just one of those things where like, when I read this, it was like an awakening for me. I didn't know fantasy could be written this way. And I know a lot of people think, well, it's just kind of nostalgia. No, because I just reread it, guys. It's not nostalgia. I still feel this way. There is nothing that has come close to this for me. And it's no other, no other fantasy author, I think, can paint a picture with words the way that George can. He can paint one page, one page, and he can basically, you can envision the look, the feel, and the emotion of his world with no problem because he's such a wizard at it. And I don't know if that will ever be copied. It's just the guy is special. I don't know what else to say about it. And the most amazing thing, guys, is this isn't even the best book in the series, but as you can tell, it is one of my favorite fantasy books of all time. If I was doing a top 10, it would definitely be on there. If I'm having repeats, because it isn't my favorite in the series, but I love it that much. It really is that amazing. So guys, I want to continue doing this series. I'm gonna be doing it slowly because I wanna make sure that I do it the way that I feel like it deserves to get. That's why I'm taking so long between these. I think I did Fire and Blood like three months ago, four months ago. And uh, I don't know when I'll be doing Clash of Kings, I'll be doing it before I reread A uh, Storm of Swords uh, in the spring, I think is when I'm going to do that one. But uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I read A Clash of Kings right after, and then I said, okay, I'm going to kind of take a break and come back to A Storm of Swords a little later. It's like a big read-along that's going on with uh, Joanna Reeds, and she's got a big old group together. They're going to be doing this for the first time. So I said, I want to slow down and kind of pick up with them when they get there, because the only thing I think that A Song of Ice and Fire fans love more than people getting into the series is people reading it for the first time and seeing their reactions, especially if somehow they have avoided spoilers of the television show and they go into this completely blind, not knowing what they're going to get. That's just, you know, I'm going to get some extra butter on that popcorn and watch this journey for them. I'm really excited. So guys, uh, A Game of Thrones, again, I don't know what else to say. It's it just pretty much damn near a perfect fantasy book. Introduced some of my favorite characters of all time. Some of the most shocking twists an amazing plot and just a hell of a ride so a game of thrones guys what did you think have you read it why don't you let me know why don't you drop in the comments let me know let me know if you guys want me to do a spoiler talk about this because i know by now just about everyone has either read this or watched the show and they want to hear me talk spoilers maybe i might do that i just try not to do that if you guys are not really interested because that's a lot of content to make a spoiler free and a spoiler review for a book if you guys aren't really interested in talking if you'd like me to do this as like a conversation with some other people i could maybe do that as well these are all things i'm open to feedback on so drop in the comments guys let me know what you think and have a safe and merry merry christmas and watch out for white walkers